cement further uh, the gender equity. And that is from the postgrad uh, side, but from the senior scientist and the emerging senior scientist level, not only in Africa, but uh, the, the South, but uh, uh, at the beginning from Africa, whereby we have funding, whereby we invite a maximum of uh, scientists from a number of African countries, being in the North, the South, East, West, the East, the center, to come down to spend time with us between some weeks to uh, three months to six months to a year uh, for senior scientists, because it happened that uh, in South Africa, we have, uh, uh, we are really, uh, how can I say, uh, lucky to have uh, a very large amount of uh, research infrastructure uh, of a world class. And thanks to the, uh, the South African Department of Science and Technology uh, for uh, such a support. And well, research activity of the UNESCO chair for those who want to spend some time with, uh, with us being a student or being a emerging scientist, <coughs> sorry, uh, or, uh, uh, or uh, senior scientists who would like to join us for a short or long period. Here are our activities, the nanomaterials for energy, nanomaterials for photonics applications, nanomaterials by green processing, nanomaterials by uh, biomimicking. And this really program specifically, this one is driven by an outstanding uh, student on originally from Ghana and nanomaterials and radiations because it happened that uh, we have two groups. One is hosted at Itamba Labs uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, it's an accelerator based science uh, institution. Therefore, we have uh, quite a large amount of radiation type that we can use to investigate uh, both fundamental and technological properties and to design and engineer materials using accelerator based uh, uh, radiations or uh, uh, nuclear radiations, such as uh, gamma radiolysis, uh, for example. Uh, allow me, please. This uh, section of uh, nano, ba the background of nano, was supposed to be given completely at the first, at the beginning of my, of my first lecture, but no, nonetheless, no, uh, it's never late. Uh, well, all of us, certainly you heard about the fourth industrial revolution and so on and so on, and the fifth and the 5G, 5G, 4G, what, 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 and so on. In effect, the nano is not uh, something new. It's just a stand, a normal evolution. Uh, the humanity has uh, started, or, or the human society has been affected extensively by the coal industry, industry, that is in the 70s, uh, something like that. And in the, uh, and this, uh, this was the, uh, the coal industry, which is started in the UK, has indeed uh, uh, changed the human society uh, as a whole, like the current the situation where the IT, uh, ICT has uh, uh, changed our society currently. The coal industry, it was the one who really made a huge revolution. It was the first one. And uh, we have had to wait for the, uh, the nuclear era around the 30s before the Second World War. And uh, whereby just after the Second World War, there was a massive investment in nuclear era. And therefore, uh, after the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki, unfortunately, uh, the nuclear era has seen uh, or witnessed a boom of uh, civil applications. And uh, of course, not only in terms of energy generation, but uh, using nuclear energy uh, for uh, 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 health treatments uh, protocols. In addition to that also to kill parasites, for example, if you have to import or export any uh, uh, food type of uh, uh, species, you have to irradiate it. Otherwise, it cannot be uh, uh, exported. And after the 50s, we have the, to wait for uh, the 50, uh, for the 60s, 70s, where the semiconductor technology 
came in in a force. From the 70s, we have had to, and here in the semiconductor technology, yeah, we have started with the microprocessors, uh, whereby you can, uh, how can I say, uh, print or store the information on uh, a micrometer type uh, uh, scale uh, size. From that, we move it to the biotech revolution, whereby we have started to manipulate the genes and uh, uh, more or less to uh, control the rate growth of plants, for example, or uh, stop some uh, 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 birth uh, sicknesses and so on. So we, at the level of biotech, we were able to manipulate plants, uh, fauna and flora in general, as well as the DNA of a human being. From the biotech, we move towards uh, ICT in the 90s, uh, where, uh, whereby we have had a boom of internet. And the internet, we, we, we became, it became popular. And from the ICT, we moved further and the IC, how can I say, we wanted to have uh, more capacity of storage with ICT. And we wanted to have uh, a movie, not, on, uh, uh, not only one movie on a DVD, but uh, many movies in one DVD and we wanted to have uh, uh, our data stored not in the DVD, it's because it was big, large, but we wanted to have it in a small USB, and so on and so on. That gave a birth to the nanotech. It's the ICT which gave a birth uh, to nanotech. And in effect, this uh, boom was not driven by science. No, this uh, boom was driven by the demand of the society. When, uh, how can I say, and I do believe that uh, uh, Prof. Ketevi here and other senior colleagues who are attending this uh, talk, uh, uh, I do believe that they have used, uh, how can I say, this IBM very large uh, floppy type of disk of 30 centimeters over 30 to store the, our data, for example, uh, the spectra that we have collected and so on. And in effect, before me, I, I have, I was of the generation which was using this one, the 30 centimeters of the, over the 30 disks, IBM. Before me, uh, how can I say, uh, the, those who were uh, elder than me have used in effect perforated paper to store that data. And well, we were laughing uh, uh, on them. And it happened that uh, after that, uh, we have had the DVDs and uh, just to, uh, and the stiffy disks in between. And uh, how can I say, uh, uh, from the disk, we move it to the USBs and how can I say, so we move it from uh, IBM disks uh, with the storage capacity of uh, less than uh, a kilobyte uh, to something around uh, six megabytes and, uh, 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 how can I say, well, 70 megabytes. And from that, we went to, uh, uh, how can I say, say uh, three gigabytes. And now we have terabyte type USBs. So the data storage capacity has increased with the time and the size of the storage system has decreased. And well, the logic, the rationale behind it is that, uh, the difference between the next star of IBM of one terabyte and the IBM, the initial disk of uh, less than uh, 10 kilobytes, this one and that uh, the last one is that the size whereby we were able to store the one and the zero. In the first disk of 30 centimeters of the 30 centimeters, we were storing somehow the information in a size of around uh, a centimeter or less. But in the next star, in the USBs, the, the size where we were able to store the one and the zero is the nanometer. So nanos, uh, the fact that we were able to move from this IBM to that one, whereby we were able to store the data, the one or zero in a, a centimeter squared area or a millimeter squared area to a nanometer squared area, 
because we were able to manipulate matter and to make, how can I say, uh, to make uh, uh, defined zones where we store the information at the nanometer scale. Uh, well, and this, uh, uh, this evolution was just normal because in the last century, where I was born and a number of colleagues, senior colleagues also were born in that time, what happened is that uh, we were at this level here. The fiber optics was a really something unique for us. And the size of that fiber optics uh, was uh, around 100 micrometer. That was for us outstanding. That was really very tiny. But after that, uh, we were able to uh, manipulate and to make devices uh, uh, and to manufacture devices at the level of a 0 0.1 micrometer. And that the level which has boosted more or less the semiconductor technology and going to make, uh, allowing us to make smaller pro microprocessors or microprocessors with the high density of, uh, uh, pa of uh, uh, electronic pads and electronic zones where we can store the information. From that, from that we went down to the nanoscale where we were able to make nano uh, rods of carbon or fullerene of carbon C60. And that size, the diameter of this or this fullerene is of the order of a nanometer. And this evolution was just normal because, because uh, the fibers were at the level of, uh, uh, how can I say, natural things like uh, an ant, uh, a size of a very small uh, ants, for example. The second was uh, the size of the diameter of the, the hairs, for example. And after that, we move down to micrometer type, that is the red blood salts size. And we have had to move, and the, the how can I say, the building block of the red cells or the hairs or the ants, it is the DNA. And if we, if we take a strand of a DNA, the diameter of a strand of a DNA is around between two and five nanometers. And that is the equivalent of a graphene or carbon nanotubes diameter. So it was just natural that uh, we have to be able as humanity to manipulate matter at the DNA level. And therefore, if we are capable to do that, so we will be able to make uh, uh, nano systems bottom up, not from top to the bo uh, to bottom, but bottom up. So like uh, the DNA does it, we have self-assembly in the DNA. And uh, from that we have uh, the replication system, which gives us a birth to cells, to the, uh, the red blood cells, for example, uh, on to the chitin, and uh, the cell fell assembly allows us to have hairs, and from the hairs to have other organs, and to have a living system. So here we do the same thing. We take uh, nanoparticles at the bottom, we build, we mix, uh, we manipulate these materials, we're building, we make building blocks, and to have, uh, something functional at, uh, uh, at the sc a human scale. And in particular, a typical case is the cell phone that you have. It is a composition of hundreds and thousands and the thousands of uh, nano systems. Well, just uh, I have said that the ICT, uh, how can I say, uh, for today, the storage capacity is one thing, it has been enhanced, but the storage, uh, the transmission of the information is not as fast as it should be, but it will be soon a reality. Uh, why? Because, because uh, this uh, butterfly that you can see here, the blue one here, colleagues, uh, those who would be interested, they can send them the information. Uh, in, a, in our no, uh, normal fiber optics, you can send only a limited number of uh, modes uh, inside it. But with the band gap photonics uh, uh, fibers, which is a copy of this butterfly, in particular the blue color structure of this butterfly, uh, we are currently 
capable to design fiber optics having the, the a band gap photonic uh, uh, characteristics equivalent of this butterfly. And if so, via that uh, special band gap photonic uh, uh, fiber, opt uh, fiber optics, you will be enhancing the transmission of data by a thousand, 10 to three to 10 to five, to 10 to seven, sorry. A huge amount of data uh, and the very fast data transmitted. You can imagine that in effect, uh, uh, our future world of humanity will be controlled by data. Uh, it will be so massive, so massive amount of data and so fast that you are obliged to acquire uh, IT, uh, how can I say, background at a, at a certain extent. That is said, uh, what I would like to mention is that a major property of a nanomaterial, it is its surface. Uh, a nanoparticle has a large surface area. And just to give you an idea, uh, colleagues, if in an exhaust in each modern car, in each modern engine, being it a plane, being it, a, uh, how can I say, being it a Toyota, being it Mercedes, being it Renault, being it uh, Chrysler, Ford, whatever, all of them in each modern car, in each modern automotive, in the exhaust car, you have uh, platinum. And that platinum is extremely important. Why? Because that platinum uh, is has a huge uh, catalytic activity in the sense is that uh, when the CO2, when the engine operates and work, the, it emits, the, once the fuel is consumed, it uh, gives a birth to CO2, uh, sorry, to uh, CO, uh, carbon monoxide. So this carbon monoxide is very dangerous to, uh, to the human health or to any living species health. That is CO2 has to be decomposed to become a CO2 instead CO. The carbon monoxide is, uh, uh, I can I say, is uh, very, very poisonous. So it has to be converted to CO2. From CO2, it has to be converted to carbon and to oxygen. And the one who allows to do that reaction is a platinum. But the platinum is extremely expensive. So you cannot use uh, uh, micrometric or centimetric uh, particles of uh, platinum. It's extremely expensive. It's more expensive than gold. So uh, you are obliged to use it because it is the, the, the unique material which has a, such a huge catalytic property to decompose the CO uh, to uh, CO2 and, uh, or to carbon and oxygen and to decompose the CO2 to carbon oxygen. This is the unique element who does that, uh, who is effective to, uh, to go to convert it 100%. So you are obliged to use that platinum, but you cannot use it at a, micro, uh, at a micrometric level or a centimetric level. It can't be. So therefore you have to use it at a nanometric level. And how we do that? Imagine colleagues, if we take a cube of uh, length L. And this cube of platinum, which has the length L, well, it has six faces. So the total uh, uh, surface of this uh, uh, cube here is L squared times six. If this is, uh, if the length is one centimeter, damn, it will cost you so much and the car will be so expensive that you cannot buy it. So the idea is uh, to say, well, uh, how can I get, if I divide this cube in two, in two, uh, I will have two other faces that I will be creating. Correct, colleagues? Hello, colleagues? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, it's correct. Huh? If I cut it this in two here, I will create two faces, isn't it? 
And if I ca cut again in two, and I will, I will create at each time, I will create six faces, uh, two faces, and so on and so on. Now imagine I cut uh, this cube in small cubes of L over six. And well, how many of them I will get? This is what I will get, is 216 cubes. And uh, I will ask myself, yeah, well, how many of these small cubes here I will, ha I will have to make, to, uh, I will have to have to have the same surface as uh, the big cube? How many cubes of L over six in length that I have to make uh, to get the same surface as the biggest cube? Well, I do my calculation, I will find out in effect, I would have to take only 36 of these cubes, of these small cubes, only 36 of them, which would give me uh, the same thick, uh, the same surface as the big cube. And therefore it will cost me less if it's purely platinum. So how can I say the surface uh, of uh, small particles is extremely important in a number of technological properties. Just to give you an idea, if you take a pack of sugar, if you take one kilogram of particles of one millimeter cube of uh, particles of sugar that all of us we have at home or either in a, uh, how can I say, in a coffee or restaurant, if I take uh, one kilogram of particles of one millimeter cube of uh, in size, it will have the same surface area as one milligram of particles of one nanometer cube. You would understand that if I have to use a platinum or a diamond, for example, uh, uh, instead to take one kilogram of a platinum of a one millimeter cube, I should take one milligram, I have to take these small particles and to divide them in a way to have one nanometer, grains of one nanometer cube uh, particles of platinum. And therefore, to have the same surface as one kilogram, I would have only one milligram. Therefore, it will cost me less. But the point is that the surface area is a huge at the nanometric scale. And in addition to, the, to that, as you can see, for example, if we take the small particles, as you can see, colleagues, you would understand that the number of particles on the surface, the number of atoms on the surface, it would, could be as much as important as the number of uh, atoms inside that particle. And therefore, the properties of these uh, nanoparticles is not government, governed only by the, the bulk but uh, the bulk atoms, but by also the uh, atoms on the surface in particular. And this plays a huge role when we try to do some fundamental physics, one, and in particular when we try to bioconjugate nanoparticles to make with uh, some active molecules, to make them as uh, active drugs to inject against COVID, for example or against cancer, or against uh, bacteria and so on. So because, the, and the properties of the surface of this, at, the properties of the atoms in the surface are different from those in the bulk. Because if you take this atom here in the bulk, uh, it vibrates uh, in uh, 3D dimension. Okay, it will, it is surrounded by six atoms or or at least here, at least as you can see, uh, the closest atoms are around the th six in effect, if we take the one perpendicular to the plane. But if we take this uh, atom on the surface, uh, uh, the, uh, any atom on the surface, you will find out that the surface is surrounded only by three atoms. So it, va it will vibrate uh, in a different uh, manner than the one in the bulk. And therefore, vibration point, in terms of vibration, in terms of uh, uh, physical and chemical properties, it will not be the same as the bulk. In addition, if you have a gold particle, a metallic nanoparticle, you have free electrons. And these free electrons uh, will be 
cannot leave these nanoparticles. It's as they are in a well, quantum well. And all of us, we have done Schrodinger equation and the quantum well, one quantum well type uh, uh, problem. This is exactly what you have to see here. That is exactly what you have. So you would have uh, the 3D symmetry, which is broken, like we said. Many atoms on the surface, they will not vibrate as in the bulk. You have localized states because you have electrons which cannot leave out these particles. They are uh, uh, stored in this uh, wall, in this prison. Okay, so therefore, uh, optical properties are very sensitive to that and you will see that and as we mentioned the nanoparticles are governed by high surface to the volume uh, one of the major characteristic of electrons stored in uh, nanoparticles is the plus one absorption i will not go through this is a purely optical stuff gold in uh, uh, how can i say if you go let's say in uh, to Ghana or for Knox, those who are in the US or in Burkina Faso or, or a number of African countries, you will find the gold. And gold is yellow bulk wise. And well, but at the nanoscale, no, it is not gold, it's not yellow. Uh, why? Because the Heisenberg and Centenity, you will find out that these nanoparticles, at least using that uncertainty principle as a first approximation, you would find out uh, that uh, uh, the color of nanoparticles of gold, when they are small, you can tune them. They can be yellow and they can be red, ruby like wine, very deep red. And if you change their shape, you can tune them, not from the, only the yellow, but you can have them brown, green blue and so on and if you malik there is a the question language, yes sir. uh saeed uh, has a yes. question yes Saeed, please yes Saeed. um okay maybe i, I will just read the question has yes. other element been used as catalyst in the production of carbon and oxygen before settling with platinum, especially the one in the same group? Yes, yes. But the most effective one is a platinum. They're really very good one. The fact that the cost is very high, elevated, therefore, uh, indeed, Said is right uh, to point out to that. Indeed, quite a number of uh, research is done worldwide. Uh, uh, for example, the Department of Energy in the US uh, embarked in uh, an international partnership with Japan, Europe, and so on, to try to engineer uh, carbon-based uh, composites who would, who would exhibit the same efficiency as a platinum. Yes, correct. I hope that I have responded to the question of Said. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, oh, yes. he's here now, good. Okay. The, so if we take another element, for example, silver, which is a noble metal like, uh, if we make it in a form of prismatic nanoparticles, prismatic nanoparticles still by uh, using the approximation of uh, uh, Heisenberg's certainty, we are capable to more or less guess the color of these uh, nanoparticles according to their size and shape. So as you can see, uh, we can control and tune the properties, the optical properties, by controlling the shape and the size of nanoparticles. And these are, how can I say, these nanoparticles like this, the gold and silver and platinum, would be a part of uh, the modern medicine or medical uh, protocols in future. Uh, well, during the uh, I wish really to single out this a typical example, and particularly is Marzan and uh, colleagues from the US. When there was uh, an anthrax after 11 September, 
September 11 in the U.S. attack, unfortunately, which I hope it will never repeat itself, and humanity should be wise. And what happened, what really what took place in, in the U.S. was really sad to all humanity, not only to the U.S. colleagues, but to all humanity. Uh, there was a campaign starting by using anthrax. And the one, how can I say, uh, the one who came with the uh, typical exam application of gold uh, uh, for uh, detection of uh, anthrax were a team of, I think, Liz Marzan, uh, it's not Liz Marzan, uh, Chad Makin, sorry, Chad Makin uh, team who used the nanoparticles of gold to uh, uh, identify using this change of color uh, to identify the anthrax. And it's exactly the same thing that we are proposing to detect fast the, uh, the COVID. La in less, the change of color is less than an hour, less than 10 minutes in effect. Well, at the, le at the nanometric level also, one of the early demonstration of the size effect was the melting temperature of gold. I was a Swiss team uh, before uh, at all, who were the first ones to show that uh, the melting temperature of gold depends of, on its scale. And as you can see, this is the curve, and this is the law governing the melting uh, point of uh, uh, nanoparticles of gold uh, versus the size. This is the melting point uh, of nanoparticles, this is the bulk, and it given, it's governed by this uh, law here. Uh, something else in the semiconductor technology, what we have uh, on our uh, cell, cell phones, all of us, all of us, we don't have, uh, we try in the cell phones, for example, we try not to use uh, rare earth to get the colors that we have on our cell phones or any flat screens, but to use quantum dots like ZNS, zinc sulfide, and so on and so on. And these quantum dots, in general, in the bulk, they have a fixed ba uh, band gap. The band gap is the gap, the energy gap between the conduction band and the valence band. So in the bulk, it's defined and fixed, and you cannot change it. But when you go down at the nanoscale, you remember where the electron is, uh, uh, stored in a quantum uh, uh, well, and therefore, if it is the case, the band gap in nanoparticles can change. It can move from the red to the blue, and it's exactly what you see here. And it's exactly what quantum mechanic, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, allows us to expect. So the band gap can be tuned versus the size. And here is the uh, I think it's cadmium sulfide. And uh, quantum mechanic is a dam very well, beautifully verified uh, accordingly, according to this quantum uh, quantification of energy uh, by the basic fundamental of quantum mechanic in effect, in particular in quantum dots here of uh, the zinc sulfide here, ZNS. Where you go to the bulk and here you go to small nanoparticles. And uh, Rare earth are very expensive, but these ones, the ZNS, the sulfites are very cheap. Otherwise, our cell phones will not be color or our flat screens will not be as color as, and not expensive. Uh, well, also in the nanoparticles, one of the beauty of them is that you can control the shape. The zinc nanoparticles, if I take a zinc nanoparticles, in particular, number four, in the page here, number four, this is the nano powder used at sunscreen when you go uh, to the beach to stop the UV, so to minimize the skin cancer. And uh, the same uh, uh, oxide can be made in a form of belts uh, for piezoelectric applications, uh, like uh, uh, tubes for uh, field nano emissions, uh, like uh, uh, can I say rings for uh, nano resonator uh, lasers and so on and so on. So uh, the same material but different shapes would be able to have uh, 
a large a, a large amount of uh, capabilities I, something I, else which is a real fundamental importance the case of nanomaterials that what we could what we mentioned metamaterials colleagues up to now all up to now all of us all of us we, we have been taught that the the electric permittivity and the magnetic permittivity are positive and uh, therefore uh, they how can i say and these are fundamentals of electrodynamic epsilon and mu are from the early stage of uh, uh, maxwell and uh, moving towards uh, einstein whoever all the forefathers of modern science the, the permittivity and the magnetical electric are positive this stops to be true uh, in the field, uh, in the case of nanomaterials it is not true anymore what does it mean that means uh, epsilon and mu can be negative because uh, the real uh, the real uh, kind of the real parameters which are related to uh, epsilon and mu in any formula in any physical phenomena and so on in effect it brings uh, the ratio of epsilon and mu or the product of epsilon and mu and therefore how can i say uh, epsilon and mu can be negative both or can be positive the ratio can is is always positive so the roots of electrodynamics are not violated at all they are valid but the point that epsilon and mu can be negative it is contrary to newton uh, to isaac newton to albert einstein to uh, how can i say whoever you go to through the how can i the basics of science or the basics of physics but if epsilon and mu are negative that would affect the optical properties of the uh, of this material that which we call metamaterials and these are the new materials imagine that you have a material with the negative refractive index if you have a material with a refractive index that means uh, uh, colleagues i don't want to spend more time on this but i would like to just to go to the result straightforward you can more or less uh, go to through the through this uh, graph of uh, snellius descartes and you remember it tells us that if you send an incident beam it will be reflected with the same angle and refracted with an angle theta correct and the refracted beam the refracted beam will be in the same half a plane as the reflected beam with a meta material which means with the material which has a, a negative electric uh, permittivity and the negative magnetic or negative magnetic permittivity and permeability this uh, how can i say this is wrong the how can i say uh, is there a question no ah. there's no question okay so what does it mean that means that uh, if i send the beam on a metal material the refracting the refracted beam will not be in the same the same plan half a plane as the reflected beam but it will be in this the same plan as the incident beam so it will be here and what does it mean what does it mean that means you have you would have a super resolution if you work on it well uh, just a typical example here is uh, uh, an engraving with the highest resolution uh, of the word nano here here the second image is the image of uh, this uh, nano via the best highly 
optically polished uh, lens that you can ever produce. That gives you this. And the third image is the image of the, the nano image, the initial one, via a thin film a glass coated with a, a metal material of, uh, uh, made by silver, a 35 nanometer slayer. Colleagues, if I call this the original one, this is one, one uh, sorry, one, two, and three, you would agree with me that the resolution of three is better than the two, isn't it? Yes. Thank you. And it's better even that the, the first image, isn't it? Exactly, yes. Here, and here you have a super resolution. That is because you have the epsilon, this nano silver of uh, uh, film of 35 nanometer layer of silver, it behaves uh, like a perfect metamaterial that is epsilon z negative and mu is negative. The, and it gives you the highest resolution, which means that in the future, our uh, glasses will be coated with uh, uh, these metamaterials and we will be able to see like an eagle, not only to see at that high resolution at a short distance, but a very long distance. We would have a capability of an eye of an eagle because this, uh, uh, how can I say, this uh, property of epsilon negative and mu negative. And this, in effect, not new. Before I was born, before I was born, Veselacho, a Russian, came with a paper which was rejected by physical review letters. And well, and he was obliged, he has been asked uh, to publish that in uh, a West journal. So he was obliged, as a Russian, so he was obliged to publish it in a Russian journal because they wanted really to show that uh, 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 Vizelaho wanted to see what would be the response of the international community. But it was only in 2000, John Pandry uh, from the UK has made this possible. Well, if you remember what we said, uh, Richard Feynman said that, ah, would it be able to write the Bible or, or the full encyclopedia on a pin of uh, uh, a needle? Well, and that was in 60s when he said that. It happened that uh, now we are capable to write at the level of nanometer. Remember, a nanometer object is an, an object which has one of its size is smaller than 100 nanometer. And if this, if this time we are capable to write with the resolution of 60 nanometer, it will come a day where we will be able to write at the level of an atom size, that is a nanometer. So it, it was, how can I, it is possible. And uh, what is extremely important is that uh, uh, we have now capability to manipulate the matter at that level. And to do so, we are obliged to use large facilities like uh, the synchrotrons, for example, or like uh, neutron scattering uh, techniques as the European synchrotron radiation facility, uh, uh, neutron scattering uh, source in uh, uh, ESS in Lund and at ELL and uh, uh, the uh, the ESS in the US and so on, for these materials to have a clear idea what is happening and so on, and to understand their properties, so therefore to, by you engin or to engineer the right elements, you are obliged to use these large facilities. In Africa, we don't have, therefore we go towards the, uh, towards, uh, the usage of these large facilities. I will start, if you allow me, by the first example, where I show that we are capable to tune the surface tension uh, with material, nanomaterials. Sir, can I please ask a question? Yes, sir. Yes. I just wanted to find out if, like, there are, I don't know, um, 
projects where they've started developing these classes that you spoke about, or you could see at very large distances? Yes, there are, there are, there are different groups. In particular, John Pendry in the UK, uh, and also short glass in the in Germany uh, and uh, uh, colleagues from Rochester University in the US. They use extent. They are working extensively on this. You do understand that uh, these materials uh, have, are of prime, pivotal importance in uh, uh, glass technology. There are. Okay. There are definitely. We can facilitate if you are interested. You can contact John Pendry, for example. Can send you his details uh, at Rochester. There are uh, possibilities. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd really appreciate that. Thanks. Yes. And uh, as the first example that I would like really to show you is the surface tension and its tunability. Well, all of you, all of us, certainly one day or another, we observed uh, early in the morning uh, water on the leaves. And some leaves, I can say the droplets of water, they do not cover the leaf, but they form droplets like, uh, like marbles, okay. And uh, you see that, uh, how can I say, on a number of uh, leaves. Well, uh, in effect, you have do, two different of uh, surfaces. Uh, surfaces which coat, uh, ah, surfaces, uh, once you put the droplet of water on them, they, they coat the surface. Okay, they coat it. We call it hydrophilic, a hydrophilic surface. It's a surface on which liquid, how can I say, uh, can wet. A wettable surface is a surface which is, uh, how can I say, on which a droplet of water just can uh, spread. And you have a surfaces on which the uh, water cannot, uh, spread, we call them hydrophobic. So in mother nature or in the nature, you have two types of surfaces. Surfaces which are hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Surfaces on which the liquid or water in particular spreads and others where on, on which the water cannot spread. In our work, and this in any system, absolutely any system, uh, either surface spreads water or does not spread water. You can't have in between, none. But in our case, we would like to show that in effect, yes, we can design nanoparticles whereby you can spread water or you can avoid to spread it. Better than that, better than that, we would like to show that in effect at the nanoscale, we are capable to design a surface uh, uh, in a, within, a, within which we will be able to move from one state to the other one and vice versa. Not only to have it from one state to the other one, but tunable and to get it in between. And this is of a really critical importance in a number of applications, in particular biology, photonics, and uh, other applications. For example, uh, it is intended, the work of the, uh, the, the PhD students that was uh, uh, currently who graduated long time ago, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Baladiop and Gom, from Sheikh Anta Diop uh, University. He was the one who ran this experiment to design it and so on. The intention of his work was to design 
liquid lens with a tunable focus. I will not go through the details, but nonetheless, it was done by, uh, how can I say, by a company in Singapore. It's a French company, uh, a German French company, Varioptic, in, uh, in Germany, using this principle of two liquids, a liquid and oil and water, and uh, applying a, a voltage here, changing the meniscus. Changing the meniscus is changing the, the curvature of the droplet and therefore changing the focus. But this fellow, this fellow Bala, who got two PhDs, one from Sheikh Anta Diop University in Senegal and another one at University of South Africa, yeah? And he got it cum laude and magna cum laude, colleagues, and he got two PhDs in four years and a half. And to show you how, how resilient are these outstanding African fellows and how innovative are they when they have, uh, when they are surrounded by the right uh, uh, positive constructive surrounding. Nonetheless, he came with the possibility of uh, doing the same thing as this uh, company, sorry, as this company in uh, Singapore, but instead to use uh, Electro, electro, electrostatic to control the meniscus here, he uh, showed that it is possible to use optics, a laser, to, call, to use optics to tune this uh, surface tension. And I will show you how, colleagues. Well, and in effect, uh, this uh, idea is not ours. Uh, well, uh, this uh, uh, this was a basic model of what we call the model of Wenzel and Cassi that was published early, just before the Second World War in 1936. And uh, just after the Second World War in 1944, whereby it was demonstrated if you have a rough surface, if you have a rough surface, you will be able to control the the contact angle. And this is the contact angle which controls the surface tension. Then they have showed that indeed, if uh, uh, the roughness is, uh, uh, is small, the contact angle is small, when it increases, when the, the system is rough, it becomes, uh, the contact angle increases. What does it mean? In that time, they were not capable to make to design nano rods as we are capable to do now. That was just after the First World War and just after, before and after World War, uh, Second World War. So what does it mean? That means as uh, this, law, this graph tells us, or this model of Wenzel Cassie tells us, if you have a rough surface, whereby you can control this roughness of this surface here, you will be able to control the contact angle. And if you control this contact angle, theta, you will be able to control the surface tension because the surface tension is related to this angle here. So that is exactly what we do with the field of nanosciences and nanotechnology. We are capable to design and engineer nanosurfaces with a, such a kind of antenna, narrow nanorods like this. Well, it is possible to do such with the, how can I say, what, what he has done, uh, Balan Gom, he made nanonorods, nanorods of a zinc oxide, highly crystalline, as you can see by this AFM, as you can see the, yeah, this, uh, the top uh, of this nanorods of the zinc oxide, uh, if you go to a large uh, magnification, you will see that they have indeed, they are nanorods, hexagonal nanorods. We know exactly why they are not, why they are hexagonal. We know exactly why, and so on and so on. So what happened is that if you take these nanorods of zinc oxide, they act like uh, what we said, we have a very nice rough surface within which we control the height 
of these rods and we control the distance between two rods, two successive rods. And if we do the experiments, colleagues, at the beginning, at the beginning, we put this droplet here, we put this droplet on that surface of zinc oxide that I showed you, this one. We put the droplets here, okay. At the beginning, there are no UV. As you can see, the contact angle is uh, quite uh, high, as you can see. And uh, uh, this is without UV. When, what we do, we shine the surface with the UV light. And this UV light activate the zinc oxide. I don't want to go through the, the physics behind. I don't think that we have a time here. But nonetheless, with the time from one minute to 63 minutes, you can see that uh, this, uh, the contact angle uh, changes. Okay, it moves from this value here over 90 to a smaller angle and so on. Huh? Remember the contact angle. And, and so on and so on. Higher is the amount of illumination, smaller is the contact angle, as you can see. It goes, it decreases. And when you remove the UV, that uh, droplet, it comes back to its initial somehow uh, status. And if you shine again, you would go towards uh, this. And you, if you remove the UV, it goes back to its uh, initial state. So by changing the contact angle, as you can see, we change the surface tension of the liquid. And that is a confirmation of a tunability of a thermodynamic macroscopic parameter, which is the surface tension. Uh, again, the aim of uh, PhD, uh, Dr. Balangom in that time is to make a, a liquid optical lens, which could be controlled with a focus controllable tunable by uh, light. And this would, uh, how can I say, allow number of applications that I should not discuss this. But in, 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 unfortunately, it has not worked. Why? Because the surface at the bottom here, which is a zinc oxide, nanorods, they diffuse light extensively. So we have to optimize the size and the distance between the nanoparticles to minimize this uh, uh, scattering. My second case that I would like to share with you is the vanadium dioxide. And uh, to show you that when we go, while this vanadium oxide has a, a specific functionality at uh, when it is large, when it's bulk, when you tune it, when you go to smaller sizes, you can multiply its functionality. So this is what I would like to show with you. But uh, one of the major characteristic characteristics of this material is that it behaves like this animal. Uh, this animal, you find it mainly, uh, those who fly Qatar, they have seen this animal. It is the logo of Qatar Airways. And this animal, it is also, you find it extensively in the Southern Africa, uh, in Namibia, in South Africa, in Botswana, and in uh, uh, also in Kenya, you find it. And in uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and the Euro Arab United, uh, they wanted to reintroduce it. In Arabic, it's called Al Maha. And in our case here, we call it uh, Hemsbok. And uh, the Latin name of this animal is Eland. What happens with this material and why it's really important? This animal is capable not to drink water for uh, days, for weeks, for months. And yet it moves in a, in a hostile atmosphere of, uh, uh, it reaches around 66, 56 sorry, degrees Celsius in, um, in the Namib, for example. Yet he does not sweat, this animal. And remember, if you are surrounded by uh, uh, heat, uh, 
uh, hot atmosphere, your body, uh, its temperature has to rise to be in equilibrium with the surrounding. This is what thermodynamic tells us. But this animal is, uh, has a skin and it regulates the temperature of uh, its skin and make it in a way that it's, the temperature of its skin is different from the temperature of inside of its body and the temperature of its skin is always delta T higher than the, sur the surrounding. So he will not gain heat from the surrounding. Therefore, he will, its temperature cannot rise and therefore it cannot sweat. The sweat is the water. So he cannot lose water. How he does it, this animal? He does it in this way. During the day, during the day, this animal here uh, consumes a huge amount of oxygen. Uh, yeah, it consumes, uh, no, no, sorry, during the night, during the night when uh, the temperature is low in the, uh, in the desert, it consumes a huge amount of oxygen. But in the day, it consumes, when it's hot, it consumes less oxygen. I repeat myself, in the uh, uh, atmosphere surrounding of 56 degrees Celsius, this animal consumes less oxygen, okay, through his nostrils. It consumes less oxygen. And in the night, he, when the temperature drops, lower than 56, it consumes a amount, huge amount of oxygen to ensure that his metabolism is working to keep it uh, safer, not to uh, freeze. There is a material, and it does it every day, every night and day in the morning. When the sunrise sun uh, set, it, does, it goes from this to that and so on and so on. And it does it every day, so it does not sweat. There is a, a material which does this kind of stuff. We call this uh, hysteresis behavior. If you change this oxygen consumption, by what we call electric resistance. Uh, this material has this uh, phenomena. Its electric resistance changes like this. When it is cold, it is uh, highly resistive. When it is hot, its resistance is very low. When the resistance is very low, we say it's, uh, it's metallic behavior. When the resistance is very high, we say it's an insulating behavior. And this material, this material does it exactly like that. It has an hysteresis. And it goes from top, highly resistive to low resistive. Low resistive to high resistive and so on and so on. And this material is exactly that VO2, which has the same behavior as this Hemsbok. Okay. So if you take this thin film, which has been made by uh, Dr. Kala, Jean Bosco Kanakana from uh, previously University of Yaoundé, University of South Africa. And uh, he, is, uh, uh, he has also got uh, two PhDs, one uh, from the University of Yaoundé, francophone, and one anglophone from the University of uh, uh, UNISA. And currently, uh, gentlemen and gentlewomen, this fellow is the managing director sorry, is the managing director at Intel in the USA. And if you use in the future, if you hear about uh, VO2-based memory stocks, it will be an African fellow who has done it. That is Jean Bosco Kanakana at Intel in the US, colleagues. Huh? So he was the one who has uh, uh, this result uh, it was the one who, uh, who got it. It shows you a thin film of VO2 at uh, uh, a temperature lower than 60 degrees Celsius. It's uh, highly resistive. And if you heat it above 68, it becomes metallic. Low resistive, high resistive. Low resistive, high resistive. Metallic, semiconductor and insulator. Transparent IR, 
reflecting IR. That's what does it mean? Here, when it is a semiconductor or insulator, that means it's al it allows that the thin film of VO2 on a glass, it allows infrared to pass through. When it is metallic, the infrared radiation are reflected back. They are not transmitted. And this is extremely important. These are uh, the different uh, thin films that were synthesized by him and other fellows. Aline Simo, also from University of uh, Yaoundé, who is a postdoc currently and who will be moving to Italy. She got uh, these results also. I will not. The point is, this material has been initiated, initially pointed out to by Morin from, from the US, and after it was Sir Neville Smot who gave it a huge amount of importance, and its uh, investigation was a little bit dead until it was uh, 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 again, the, it was a, its rebirth through uh, Nobel laureate Egyptian Ahmed Zivail from Caltech and his student David Baum, who demonstrated the possibility to do 4D crystallography, that means crystallography in space and in time. And Cavalieri has showed that transition from a semiconductor to a metal or metal to an insulator, uh, uh, in effect, it takes place in the femtosecond regime. And it was the first time where a phase transition was measured by uh, Cavalieri at, at all in the USA, the, uh, I think it's in, yeah, I do not remember exactly where, but uh, it is not of importance for us here. The point is that the phase transition from a metal to semiconductor, uh, from a uh, metal to an insulator or insulator to a metal, it is extremely very fast, is uh, 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 of the order of 120 femtosecond very fast, 10 to minus five second. And the first one who, demo, who showed this, who's observed this phase transition in the femtosecond regime via crystallography was the Nobel laureate from Egypt, Ahmed Zivail, uh, and his student, David Baum from Caltech. Well, this, um, this metallic transition is also crystallographic transition. I don't want to go through that, it's a reversible. You move from one to the another one, from a low temperature to high temperature, and so on and so on. The point is, uh, uh, I would like just to point out some, even maybe uh, you are not uh, familiar with, the, uh, with this. Allow me please still to stress on the fact that this material, when it moves from metallic to a semiconductor or an insulator and vice versa, it goes back. Uh, uh, when it's semiconductor or an insulator, it's infrared transmitted. It allows the IR to come in. When it's metallic, it stops the IR the, because it's IR opaque, metal automatically is uh, opaque. Remember, if you take your glass, uh, your glass allows the heat from the sun to come in. Uh, to your house or to your car. And when it's, uh, if you coat your glass by thin film of gold or a silver, uh, the IR will be reflected. So I would like just to stress on the fact that this change from infrared transmittive to infrared opaque is due to the opening or closing of the uh, band gap. Uh, it's the orbitals which split and allows that band gap to open or to close here. Either there is no band gap in the case of metallic, or there is a small band gap of 0 0.7. And you will see that the optical uh, properties of this material uh, due to this opening and closing of this band gap is extremely important, extremely important. And I will single out, I would don't want to go through the, the theory. Uh, this experiment was done by also, I think Jean Bosco Kanakana from, uh, from uh, now that company in the US. Uh, Intel, right? 
Yeah, Intel, sorry, yes, Intel, yes. He was the one who showed it, and believe it or not, he was the one who made it possible to allow us to be highly cited in the international literature. This young man originally from Cameroon. And well, uh, it shows you simply said, this is the refractive index variation with the temperature versus the wavelength. If you go to the Bible of the, uh, of the optical materials that we call the Palik, you will never find a material which refractive index changes so much. And see here, for example, at 1000 nanometer, that means near infrared radiation, the refractive index from, moves from 3.2 to nearly 1.6, is two, twice. Twice, you will never find, I challenge you, you go and look for any material which, which has a, such a property, you will not find it. So this fellow has managed to do so. And what does it mean? And here you will uh, certainly understand, sorry. What does it mean? That means if I have a thin film, I have a, my glass window at home or my car coated with this VO2. If I have that glass window coated with this VO2 at room temperature, this is the optical transmission versus the wavelength, okay? As you can see, colleagues, I put in the blue here, shade, the visible and the near infrared region. In the, in the orange here window here, I put the IR. You can see, colleagues, that if a thin film of VO2 is coated on a glass, it's if, if its temperature is low at around 20 degrees Celsius, you can see that the transmission of the, this thin film here is quite high, okay? And it can go to nearly 80% to higher infrared. So it's nearly, uh, uh, you can say around, around 78, 75%. Uh, uh, it's highly transmittive. So the infrared radiations are highly transmitted in this region when the temperature of this film on the VO2 is 20 degrees Celsius. When you heat that uh, film at about 80 or above 68, its transmission is given by this black curve here, as you can see, and the transmission is less than 10%. As you can see, what does it mean? That means uh, when it is hot, when the thin film on that glass is hot, the, the film is reflective. It does not allow the infrared to come in. It's opaque to the infrared. What does it mean? That means that this uh, film stops the infrared when it's hot. That means that if you are in your car and your car is coated with this VO2, at 20 degrees Celsius, if the, if the temperature outside the, uh, the car is less than 20 degrees Celsius, which means it's cold, the heat, the infrared uh, from the sun are transmitted through the window to, your, uh, to inside of your car. That is this curve. When it is hot uh, outside of your uh, car, uh, the heat from the sun uh, will be stopped by the coating on your window. Therefore, it will stop your, uh, uh, that heat from the sun, and therefore, you would not uh, feel the heat from outside. It's as if you have a smart air conditioning. As if you have a glass which is a smart, which stops heat when it's hot and allows the heat from the sun to come in when it's cold. And that's exactly what you have here. Here is a small house. It's a toy house. It's a toy house by Kanaka now, of course. And uh, uh, a glass window here, uh, coated with a VO2. 
and another one which is exactly the same, non-coated with the VO2. And there is thermometer inside here, and the reading of the thermometer here. For the glassware, you cannot, uh, there is no coating of VO2, you have a lamp, and that lamp simulates sun at 1.5. And here, the temperature that you read inside with the thermometer inside the glass, uh, in the side of the room here, is uh, nearly 42 degrees Celsius. With the, uh, with the glass coated with that material, and as you can see the thermometer, the thermometer instead 42 uh, degrees, it shows uh, 33 degrees Celsius, which is nearly t uh, 10 degrees, we can say, difference. And this 10 degrees is a huge difference. It's extremely huge difference in terms of energy, uh, uh, how can I say, amount. And here, if you have to, uh, in this room here, if you have to bring this temperature down to uh, 32, you have to use air conditioning. So here you don't use any air conditioning. It's Mahala, it's free. Because this material, it's a smart, it, it, when it senses that it's hot, it becomes metallic. It becomes opaque to infrared. When it is cold, when it is cold outside, it allows the heat to come in. So it's a smart window or a smart coating. And you would understand that uh, this is uh, of extremely importance in uh, 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 climate change because air conditioning is the one which consumes a huge amount of energy in any car. It's around 40% of fuel consumption. I think uh, I would really stop here uh, or maybe I will jump. Uh, well, this material is used extensively in uh, small satellites that we call nanosat. Uh, this is the one of the first ones who have uh, to use this uh, for these CubeSats. These CubeSats or new nano satellites, what they call them. Uh, they are small, but they are extremely effective. And Google, for example, will be sending a huge amount of these uh, nano satellites everywhere to be able to have access to internet easily. And one of those who wanted to use this for as a coating for nano satellite to, uh, uh, to protect them from the damage from the the radiation of the sun, because remember satellites, it rotates, it turns around the earth, and uh, therefore it has to, this, these coatings, the electronics in these small satellites must uh, be coated against the heat, which could damage the uh, microprocessors and all the electronics inside the, these satellites. And the one who taught, uh, who was uh, my PhD, who was trying to work on this, was uh, Ifriqi. Uh, from also Cameroon, uh, and he was the one who created his own company, and he was the one who was trying to use this coating for uh, small satellites. And also he investigated the radiation damage on these uh, materials uh, in different regimes, you know, uh, and using accelerator-based techniques to uh, assess these damages. Uh, I think I should really, I should jump because uh, 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 Alin Simo have showed that this material is extremely very sensitive to hydrogen. And uh, she has demonstrated that the, it's the unique material for the moment which can sense hydrogen at room temperature. And you are aware that uh, the quite a bulk of uh, cars in the future will be hydrogen based. And remember, hydrogen is a very explosive, it's dangerous gas. Uh, any leak from uh, the cylinder of hydrogen has to be detected, otherwise there will be huge explosion. And therefore you have to design a sensor to be able to detect the lowest amount of uh, leak of hydrogen. And therefore, she has designed Aline Simon from the University of 
Yayun Day also has designed this nanobelts of uh, uh, this VO2 and showed that it's very sensitive at room temperature at the level of 14 ppm. And it's not sensitive to other gases, it's a highly selective. And justice to the work that was done by uh, Diallo. Yeah. No, no, it's not Diallo, it's another student here. It was an initial student from Rwanda who showed that this material can be used as a laser protection uh, uh, coating against power high power lasers. This uh, binocular, as you can see, is used by Dassault Aviations. And it's used now by military jet fighters because uh, uh, now the jet fighters, instead to use a missile to bring down a, a jet fighter, a, a missile is very expensive. So what they were trying to do is to blind the, uh, the with the new dim yag to blind the, the pilot. And therefore, if he is blind, he cannot see, and therefore it's done for him. So one of the materials we can stop this is that the, now the so aviation in France and others now in the USA, they use this material on the goggles and they coat it. Why? Because this material has what we call an optical, nonlinear optical properties, and this non optical, nonlinear optical properties were investigated by Aline Simo during her uh, postdoc. And I will jump to this one. I don't want to go, but you have the Conics, you have the the copy of this uh, the presentation. I would like to show in the last part, which would take maybe to five minutes, ten minutes maximum. Uh, nano in Mother Nature. If you remember last time, I mentioned to you that uh, Nano is not new. It was uh, created by a natural system long millions, millions of years ago. And uh, this is the case of what we call magnetostatic bacteria. If you take this bacteria in the North Pole and in the South Pole, this bacteria will move only perpendicular to the Earth. It moves up and down, up and down to the, to the Earth. If you take that magnetostatic bacteria to the equator, it will move parallel to the Earth, not perpendicular but parallel. Why? Because that bacteria, it, uh, how can I say, uh, it moves according to the orientation of the magnetic earth field. Why it does so? Because inside of that bacteria, you have small particles of iron oxide or iron sulfide. And these oxides, and these oxides, are magnetic. Da. Yes. Da. 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 Hello. Is that a question? No, I think it was just a microphone that was not. Oh uh, yeah, there was no question. Please go ahead. Okay. So this bacteria, in fact, they have uh, uh, magnetostatic bacteria, uh, magnetostatic nanoparticles, and they are, these magnetostatic particles are iron sulfide or iron oxides, and under the they are magnetic uh, plots, and under the mag magnetic field, they orient themselves as a necklace. So the bacteria will orient itself according to the orientation of this necklace. And this magnetostatic bacteria, believe it or not, marine spirillum strain MV4, uh, can produce nanoparticles uh, uh, of sulfides or oxides, magnetic ones, uh, at different shapes, as you can see here. These are publications in Nature. And, uh, well, uh, I wish just to mention that, in effect, uh, these nanoplots of iron sulfide or iron oxide, uh, the mechanism of 
fabrication of these nanoparticles, it was discovered only in the 80s uh, and the publication came out in Nature, whereby we clearly see we have we understood the bio-nanomanufacturing bio of these plots. The second case where, and remember this bio magnetostatic bacteria, they were existing millions of years ago. And uh, the second case where uh, the nano both in space and in time works is a leaf. Uh, a leaf for its uh, uh, photosynthesis in particular, it, uh, it relies on what we call the granite and the tilacoids. These are, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, self-assembled uh, biological systems which make a multi-layered system here, like a multi-layer system as we saw at the beginning completely. And the, the, the thickness of these layers is around less than 110 nanometers and surrounded by the chloroplast, the chlorophyll type. And not only they are nanoscaled in size, as you can see, individual chains here of the tilacoids and the granite uh, within the cell is uh, coated uh, with the chloroplast. The absorption of photons from the sun uh, by the chloroplast uh, or chlorophyll uh, molecule uh, which give birth to an electron hole transport, they take place at different regimes, femto, pico, and nanosecond, and millisecond, and even higher uh, than a second. The cell that is, uh, in effect, it's a really uh, a bosonic condensation of uh, both nanoscale in space, uh, in terms of the, this is a cell. This is the electron microscopy cut section of a cell where you can see clearly the uh, chloroplast and the tilacoids and the chlorophyll surrounding it. And well, as I mentioned, because the nanoscale and the surface area, surface to the volume area, which is huge, that the photosynthesis is extremely effective. It's extremely effective, 100% for some wavelengths. Another example in which uh, Mana, the nature has done, it's really a marvelous stuff, is the case of uh, spider fibers. And this is where synchrotron radiations and the neutron scattering came in to show us this incredible capacity. You have all of, uh, all of us, we have seen the spider, in particular the spider fibers that they manufacture. Well, if you take two of uh, these, uh, uh, fibers. The fibers made by Agiopia trifasciata and the Nephila clavipes. You will find up if you measure the density, elasticity in the modulus, young modulus, the tensile strength and the breaking strength and the toughness. These are all mechanical properties. And you will go and you measure the, uh, these properties according to not the other uh, fiber, natural fibers, but the nylon and the Kevlar. The Kevlar for which we don't know exactly the formula, but uh, I can say it's produced mainly in the US by a defense type uh, company, which has signed uh, a closure agreement with the defense uh, department of the US. As you can see the Kevlar and steel. These are the ones and the PBO also another artificial material. But please go to the Kevlar, nylon, and steel. If we go to these ones, the major uh, material, the major properties is the toughness and the breaking strain. And colleagues see here, for example, in the case of Kevlar and the nylon, these are the level of 80, 20, we say, and 80 and uh, the steel is six and two, while the same property, the same parameters for the fibers of uh, the Agiopia and the Nephila are 130 and 100. This is a uh, huge. What does it mean? That means that if we take a stainless tube 
of uh, 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 I don't want really to spend time, but please go to see what is the toughness, what the breaking strain is, and you would appreciate these values, which are extremely huge. Sorry, colleagues. And well, uh, of course, I will uh, mention that paper, uh, that the case of the substantion that I have not mentioned it to you. That substantion, the leaves, they do it like this, like um, they keep water not wetting because if you zoom on this uh, leaf, you will find that you have small spikes. And this is the nano spike. Uh, sp spikes which make it which make it in a way that uh, the surface is hydrophobic if you remember and i end by the this animal uses that the same the same uh, uh, process this is a, a beetle here in the that you find in the desert in uh, namib and this uh, insect it goes to to have told the pyramids uh, of sand in the night uh, in the Sahara, in the Namib, and it waits for uh, vapor water from the ocean to come. And the water condenses on its skin, and its skin effect, it has also a nanometer type uh, uh, coating, and uh, it waits until the droplet becomes quite big, uh, it is, how can I say, it does not wet, of course, it's a surface and it wets until it uh, becomes heavy and it becomes, it goes down through this and it comes and he drinks that water. So he uses the same strategy to get his water, to get water uh, accumulated on his dorsal part. And of course the gecko, the gecko in West of Africa, you find it extensively. And, the, and how can I say, I will uh, end by this uh, typical example, is that the gecko, uh, some geckos are quite big, and you find out how damn this gecko can stick on the roof, and it does not come down, because on his toes, uh, on his toes here, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, gecko has, uh, Huge amount of uh, uh, huge amount of uh, uh, spatula like this, and this spatula they use uh, van der Waals forces. One spatula, one end of this spatula here, and the end of its toes, it's a small van der Waals force, but you have the millions of them. So the total force of uh, uh, van der Waals, of one van der Waals of one toe, uh, of one uh, spatula, if you multiply by the number of fibers, it becomes a huge. And uh, how can I say, currently it was designed, now we have designed it with carbon nanotubes, some kind like that, some uh, gloves, which have uh, such a kind of uh, uh, shape with carbon nanotubes, as you can see in this photo here the bottom and these gloves can stick on a glass and you can, uh, can uh, go up uh, uh, a skyscraper with them. So it's like, uh, uh, not uh, Superman or Batman, I do not remember the one who, but so that is uh, more or less the application of the nano from the natural uh, side, from the biomimicking. And I thank you colleagues and I hope that you enjoyed the, the talk. Thank you so much. I am ready for some questions if there are. Um, oh Malik, thanks very much for this uh, really nice and comprehensive stuff. There's so much, uh, so many applications of the nano here. Uh, it's really, really, really impressive to see. Um, so uh, Saeed had, ha, ha, has another question. Uh, Saeed, can you talk?
All right, I'll, I'll read his question. Uh, oh, sorry, so. sorry for the delay. Sorry for the... Go ahead, Said. Okay. Professor Malik, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. That was very high open. Um, actually, I want to confirm something. When you were explaining the movement of the magnesotactic bacteria on the plane of the heart, so yes. you talked about how it moves at the equator and uh, at the poles. So, now, firstly, I would like if you could actually re-explain that part. And number two, I want to know how does it move on the meridian? That's one. Yeah, what they do, what they do, this magnetostatic bacteria, they follow the magnetic field. So if you measure the magnetic field with your compass, you will find how their movement will follow exactly the magnetic field. And in effect, uh, in effect, uh, one of the ideas, you gave me an idea, thank you so much, uh, that I have to share with the geomagnetism people uh, is that uh, uh, this, uh, how can I say, if, sorry, uh, uh, in effect, uh, thank you so much for uh, pointing to that point, because uh, this bacteria could be used as uh, in archaeological sites if we find uh, for sites of magnetostatic bacteria, they could indicate to us when and what are the frequencies within which the magnetic field changes its direction. Thank you so much. And I will definitely mention your name. Sahid? Yeah, I'm here. I can hear you clearly. I can hear you clearly. Yeah. So can I, I have a question? Can I... Uh, Said, your connection seems uh, bad. We can hear you very well. Could you type the question? Yeah, I will do so. I will type in the questions. I will type in the questions. Uh, now it's better, so questions. maybe you can just say it. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So you made mention of the uh, um, spider fiber. I asked by fiber, do you mean spider web? Uh, sorry, what is your question? I said you made mention of spider fiber. So I was yes. asking that the spider fiber, is it the same thing as a spider web or is it different from the yes. spider web? Yes, remember, remember the spider, the spider produces a large amount of different type of spiders, uh, of fibers. Okay. Uh, because the ones on, the, yeah, the ones that uh, are on the, within the diameter, you remember, if you take a circle of uh, fiber, uh, of a uh, fiber network of uh, a spider, you have the circular ones and you have the diametral ones. Yeah, and these are these fibers are not the same nature, but nonetheless, then nonetheless, you uh, how can I say if you take uh, uh, if you take the uh, the fiber uh, of any spider, you will find that its mechanical properties are outstanding. And what I have not mentioned in effect, what I have not mentioned, I'm really sorry that I went fast for it. What I have not mentioned is that when you go through, when you do microscopic, um, microscopic uh, observation on these fibers, you will find out that they consist of uh, small nanobriclets of chitin, there, the, the, the size of these chitin bricklets of around 45 nanometers. And these bricklets, many of them, and these bricklets are bound and related between them with the plastic polymer, with an elastic polymer type. So the elasticity of the fiber is due to these polymers. And the hardness and the toughness and the breaking strain, and but in particular the toughness 
is due to these chitin bricklets of 45 nanometers. And these bricklets are self-assembled. And you can do that, the same experiment, on different fibers. And what is really nice is that where well, you have to use large facilities, your synchrotron type and the neutron scattering type experiments, and you would understand why we would like to biomimic this. Because the fiber is very light, ultra light, and it's tough. So imagine that you make a, how can I say, car, instead to use a steel, you use a, uh, fiber of, uh, of, this, of this nature. You have a huge mechanical strength and ultralight. Therefore, a car which has an ultralight, uh, uh, how can I say, building block, uh, and uh, uh, how can I say, uh, very tough, so it, it crashes uh, not easily, it resists, so it's safe, and it consumes less fuel. That is the the, the 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 idea behind is to produce materials which are ultra light and extremely tough for the automotive industry and the planes and so on and so on for transport and the idea is to make uh, how can i say uh, a lift uh, with this type of materials a lift to the moon Believe it or not, yes, it is a program with NASA and other group with SpaceX, for example. It is an idea to use a cable made by this. You, you may say, well, it's a dream. No. If we are capable to reproduce this, it would be a possibility. Uh, <clears throat> other questions or comments? Okay. Sorry, I just, I still want to confirm that. You made mention of the breakthrough of one of the, I think I was a, was a past doctor on the issue of uh, VO2. So I just want to know, is there a way that they could treat V2O5, that's vanadium 5 oxide, to show the same similar properties that that VO2 is showing right now? Uh, you know, uh, how can I say, you know, uh, I why not that because many I people want to do it because uh, Correct, correct. Vanadium has a valence of five, and therefore it has a huge amount uh, of oxides, as you can see in this phase diagram. Huge amount of, uh, of uh, stable oxides, and V2O5 among them, of course. And uh, the one who has this phase transition, a very nice one, is the VO2. You'll find it only in this range. And it's extremely difficult to stabilize and so on, but now, we know the tricks and so on because we have worked on it and the community worked on it also. But uh, uh, VO2 has that transi mod transition. And only V2O5, it, it, the other oxides have it, but, uh, uh, but uh, this uh, transition uh, it's of other oxides is far above the room temperature. The ideal is to have a vanadium oxide transiting as 25 degrees Celsius. While the one who is close to 25 degrees Celsius is a VO2. Uh, but the idea is to have uh, uh, something which transits at, uh, at around 25 degrees Celsius. There are others who transits at 120 or minus, minus uh, 50, something like that. But the one who transits close to room temperature is the VO2. Thank you very much, sir. Earlier, thanks. Please. Um, <clears throat> other questions? Um, this is really a very uh, prolific uh, field, uh, Mali. It's, uh, it's, it's really impressive uh, the, all of the progress and the cap capabilities that are demonstrated uh, in, the, in the nanomaterial field. Um, it's an extremely rich, and I and I think uh, our continent, Africa, need uh, technical capability in this domain for for really uh, 
engineering type of uh, achievement. Uh, and I'm glad to see all of the all of the people from Cameroon that you mentioned, uh, including yourself, who have made a uh, significant contribution in this field. This is a uh, it's really amazing. Um, uh, go ahead, please. Yes, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, that's fine, please. Uh, just, I uh, was just mentioning that in effect, uh, 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 Africa is a fantastic reservoir of youngsters. And these youngsters, if men and women, in particular the women, the female fellows, if they are, uh, and uh, young fellows in general, if they are surrounded and uh, by the right atmosphere, they are just outstanding. It's incredible how capable they are. And uh, uh, can I say, so far uh, the, the, this work, which is done by a number of fellows that I have not mentioned, Zongo Sadiqi from uh, Burkina Faso, Diallo from, uh, also from, uh, and Musa Bakayoko from Ivory Coast, and the Gabon, uh, what they have not mentioned, and it's really sad for me, that work on the neutron scattering completely at the beginning, whereby we showed that uh, the neutron can tunnel through the, uh, can be transparent to highly absorbing material, the boron. In effect, uh, give back to Caesar, which belongs to Caesar, and to Cleopatra, which belongs to Cleopatra. In effect, it was somebody, uh, was from the University of uh, Franceville in Gabon. He was the one who pointed out, and well, it happened that we have had the possibility to do the, uh, how can I say, to repeat his calculations and to do the experiment. So, and uh, what is sure is that uh, the, in the field of nanoscience and nanotechnology, it's multidisciplinary and it enriches itself via physics, chemistry, engineering, and so on and so on. And uh, this uh, possibility of using large facilities in, in, like the ESS, for example, in Sweden and uh, synchrotrons uh, the radiations in Italy, uh, Letra and uh, Soleil in France and others, we are really at the level where we are capable to move a little bit ahead and to make a difference, mm -hmm. to make a real difference. I have not mentioned something, but uh, uh, when the paper will comes out, I will send it to you. I would be glad to share it, if you could share it with all the fellows, just to show that the protocol that we proposed has started to give some positive results in terms of designing and material, uh, a protocol based on nano, but with an African plant. Yeah, no, that would be, that would be fantastic. I, I think... Uh, yeah, no, um, this is really for all of the people uh, who are connected uh, or who uh, maybe are thinking about different fields and so forth. I think the, the applied part of the physics and the engineering component is really the direction that we need in the, comp in, 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 in the continent and, and uh, the support for our younger colleagues in this domain is, is extremely important. And, yes, and, yes. Yeah, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm glad to see uh, Malik, all of the wonderful work that you are doing and with all of the people that uh, you have worked with and have promoted. This is really encouraging and, and it's, it's been a pleasure to have you to talk to us. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so, We'll be in contact with you and, and uh, you know, to have you back periodically mm. so that we are aware of, of all of the things that are going on in the, in the uh, nano field. Like you said, it's really multidisciplinary involving chemistry, physics, uh, engineering, uh, materials. So it's a really rich domain and I'm actually yes. pleased to see that. Thank you. Um, Christine, uh, you want to say something? Yeah, just as well to, again, just uh, to say that I'm really, really amazed by all this uh, wonderful work that you have uh, completed. You're really a role model, I would say, in, uh, in all this society. That's fascinating what you have done in terms of research and following up already for 
quite some time, so it was uh, very pertinent research. And, and just as you said, I think it's so important that, uh, as you said, this protocol with the African plants, so or the possibility as well to emphasize what can be done at the African level to have maybe what, what would be interesting is to make a, a survey of the different universities that you have mentioned. It's really good. And I will look also a bit through all the different uh, references that you gave. So that was very, very useful. And then as well to, to share with my colleague at the ESS, because definitively, and, and with the synchrotron light uh, source in many other places as well, to see uh, how, I mean, all those things can be even further emphasized. Huh? And, and potentially as well, this is, I would say, uh, while this survey and while all those cases, all this work is on, it's a perfect uh, cases as well to, to, to push as well for this African light source, I would say. So if we have, uh, if you have uh, uh, in Africa, a lot of, um, of capacity as well, and, and university and research group that are really following closely and with all our, I mean, potentially, hopefully, some of uh, our students that, uh, that will as well uh, look at, uh, at those possibilities. I mean, in some kind of uh, maybe 10 or, or 20 years from now, that would be just like a, the perfect goal to have uh, this as well African light source there. Yes. So thanks again. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Oh, thanks, Christine. That, that's definitely, uh, I fully agree that, yeah, we do really want to develop the capacity on the continent and support our youngsters. And, and Professor Malik Maza is uh, one of the pioneers in this domain, both in in our uh, capacity development and uh, and research, so it's it's really appreciated to have him. So we'll be having you again, uh, Malik. I will be uh, coming back to you periodically you. Uh, so that uh, you can talk to us some more. And then when we are ready to have uh, uh, the term uh, school ASP physically, uh, we'll have the pleasure to have you. Uh, talk to us uh, in person, which is what was intended uh, for Morocco. But when the situation about COVID-19 uh, is under control, uh, hopefully we'll have you in person at the school. Thank you, thank you so much. And I would, I would like really to express my profound gratitude to you and Christine and all the organizers for the, your kind invitation in associating uh, us with your uh, with this uh, fantastic endeavor, and I thank all the, the participants, Junior and Senior, for taking of that precious time and listening listening to me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. So I suggest that we stop uh, for today, and uh, we'll have Professor Malik uh, Maza again uh, at some other time. Uh, goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks again. Thanks, Zoom.